Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast entitled Deep Foundations Technical Committee. To submit a question or comment at any time during the webcast, please click on the Ask a Question button on the bottom of your screen. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Luis Garcia. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon and hello. Welcome to everyone to the GEO Institute's first week-long web conference event from August 14 to August 18, 2017, brought to GI members in an accessible format for their professional benefit and technical enhancement with relevant topics from several GEO Institute technical committees. Uh, I am Luis Garcia, and I am the chair of the GEO Institute Deep Foundations Technical Committee. Today's web conference is on Deep Foundations. We have four presentations today, and each will run approximately 25 minutes with an opportunity for a few questions at the end of each presentation. This web conference will run through approximately two and one quarter hours, uh, no more than two and a half hours. Before we get started, we would like to thank our gold sponsor, Hayward Baker, and our silver sponsor, Deep Excavations LLC, whose general support has helped make today's and the entire week-long event possible. Hayward Baker is North America's leader in geotechnical solutions with a network of local offices across North America, each with direct access to the largest geotechnical knowledge base in the industry. Hayward Baker is ready to respond with the optimal solution, whatever the location, whatever the size, whenever required. Solutions include foundation support, sediment control, ground improvement, slope stabilization, underpinning, excavation shoring, earth retention, seismic liquefaction mitigation, groundwater control, and environmental remediation. Hayward Baker is part of the connected companies of Keller, a multinational organization providing geotechnical construction solutions throughout the world. Our silver sponsor, Deep Excavation, Deep Foundations is a premier software by Deep Excavation LLC for the design of pile foundations, import CPTs or SPT test data to estimate changing soil properties. You can perform both axial and lateral pile analysis and calculate the combined axial and bending capacity. One such software does all the tough deep foundation capacity work for you. Visit deepexcavation.com for a free web meeting with one of our engineering experts. And now let's get started. We have four presenters today. They are all members of the Deep Foundations Committee. Our first presenter is Mr. Antonio Marinucci, MBA, PhD, professional engineer, and member of ASCE. His organization is V2C Strategies, LLC, and he's also a research professor and lecturer at NYU. His presentation is titled Overview and Application of Displacement Piling Technology. Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luis. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Luis said, the presentation this afternoon will be focusing on drill displacement piling technology. So let's get started. Okay, here we go. All right, so this presentation will focus on drill displacement displacement piles, what they are, what ground conditions they are suitable, the potential benefits that are garnered from using these types of piling systems. Uh, drill displacement piles can be categorized into one of two groups or main groups, uh, basically concrete displacement piles and steel displacement piles. Uh, for each of the two methods that we'll discuss here today, uh, we'll talk about the construction of the piles, the specific benefits that we can uh, be realized from the piling, and brief case histories for each of the two types of piles. Okay, as shown on the slide in front of you, um, Drill displacement piling refers to a specialized technology 
uh, in which a board pile is constructed using a process uh, that utilizes a specially designed tool that is advanced into the ground uh, using both a rotation and a downward thrust or a crowd force that is supplied by a drill rig in order to displace the in-situ soil radially outward into the surrounding formation without the creation of drill spoils on the ground surface. Uh, the technique is ideally suited for a wide spectrum of soil conditions ranging anywhere from sandy gravels to clays. Uh, the one caveat being that the soil must be able to be dr displaced as, as well as compacted. Uh, these, this type of piling system has been used as structural foundation elements in order to support column loading uh, for ground improvement. Uh, for instance, uh, with column supported embankments, and they've been used on both commercial and public type projects. Uh, dr drill displacement piles uh, can also be grouped according to the installation method and uh, based on the type or shape of the tooling that is used to create the pile, uh, which are essentially cylindrical shaped or screw shaped as shown on the two middle uh, photographs on the slide. For concrete piles, as indicated by the schematic on the upper right hand side, modern displacement tools contain uh, similar common elements, and those are a displacement body, which is the enlarged section near the bottom or approximate bottom of the drill tool, the drill string, uh, and that facilitates the soil movement radially outward, uh, displacing into the adjacent or surrounding soil. Uh, there's a drilling tip at the bottom of the drill string, and that's used to loosen up the soil during the advancement, downward penetration of the tooling. Uh, there's a hollow stem portion uh, the diameter of which is smaller typically than the displacement body, and that is used to bring the energy from the drill rig down to the tool, as well as concrete or grout later to fill the hole upon exit. Uh, there's a lower aug auger section with partial flighting, and that's used to move the soil upward towards the displacement body, and the upper segment of flights, and that's used to move any soil downward towards the displacement body. As shown on the lower right-hand photographs, uh, steel displacement piles set up is much simpler. Uh, there's a drilling tip or displacement tip at the bottom, and then there's a steel pipe that is connected, hard welded to that tip. So what happens during the actual construction of the pile, what happens to our ground. So during construction, the soil surrounding the pile undergoes some changes to the initial stress state, uh, ergo a change in void ratio. And that's a function of the soil type, original stress state, consistency, shape of the tooling, and the installation method used for that particular tool and type. Uh, the changes are directly caused by the loading that's imposed on the soil from the tool during construction, from both the radial compactive uh, and torsional stresses, as well as the vertical shearing stresses as the tool is advanced into the ground and then extracted from the ground upon completion of the installation. Ultimately, ground improvement is induced in the formation uh, by this process. And what happens is we realize larger unit values of side shear and in some instances or some increase in end bearing resistance as well. The most amenable ground condition are loose to medium dense cohesionless soils. Uh, here the compactive effort of the tooling uh, which produces that radial displacement decreases the void ratio and restructures the soil particles, <clears throat> and the effects are immediate and positive on the response of the piling element itself. Uh, the densification of the cohesion of soils and the resulting increase in horizontal stresses produces, I've said, a measure of ground improvement. Uh, in partial
partially saturated and fully saturated soils, the advancement in extraction of the tooling itself generate or may generate some uh, excess pull water pressures. And depending on the fines content, the effects may be realized quickly through a rapid dissipation of this induced pore pressure, or if there are appreciable fines, it may take longer to realize the benefits. In cohesive soils, or cohesionless soils with appreciable fine content, more than about 15%, um, we can still use drill displacement piles as long as the soils can be displaced. So we can use it in a wide range of soils from soil to stiff conditions, as long as we can displace that soil. Uh, with cohesive soils, the soil will undergo some plastic deformation as the soil is compacted during the insulation process. And we're deforming the structure plastically and in uh, for both partially saturated, fully saturated conditions, as well as we're inducing, as we mentioned for cohesion with soils, we're inducing this excess pull water pressure, but in this instance, it will take some time to realize the gains as the consolidation occurs, which is, which will be a function of the drainage path uh, of the excess pull pressure to dissipate. There are some instances or uh, some ground conditions that are of concern to us. Um, where installing drill displacement piling may be less advantageous. Uh, the first of which is uh, during, <coughs> pardon me, uh, in very loose sandy soils and very soft clay soils where maintaining an open hole above the tooling may be problematic. Uh, second, of which is in very dense cohesionless or very stiff cohesive soils uh, where the installation uh, in these soils can be quite difficult and quite uh, uneconomical. The third condition is in sensitive soils and this is where the disturbance caused by the tooling during installation could result in a remolding of the soil and the formation of residual shear planes during construction. Which would, which would be detrimental to the soil structure, uh, to the shear strength of the soil, and to the ultimate performance of the displacement pile itself. So what are some of the benefits and advantages as seen up on the slide in front of you? Uh, we, there's a resulting higher unit side resistance and head bearing resistance that can be achieved. Uh, the load displacement response of a drill displacement pile is comparatively stiffer than that of a comparably sized non-displacement pile. Uh, therefore, we'll be able to realize uh, given load resistance at a shorter length and resulting in a lower cost per ton of load with drill displacement piling. It's also a very environmentally friendly construction approach in the sense that there are a minimal amount of drill spoils that are returning to the ground surface. Uh, and this reduces the risk associated with the transport of soils, you know, disposal, especially in contaminated areas. And it lowers the risks associated with the cost of disposal, where to take it, how to dispose of it, how to treat it. Uh, in addition, there is minimal ground vibration induced by this technique because the drilling uh, from the rotary and the drill do not, it, do not themselves result or induce large ground vibrations. From a worker point of view or on, for your on-site personnel, there's also a, a more clean working platform, working area as minimal drill spoils are returning to the surface. Okay, so up on the slide in front of you now, there are four different methods that are schematically shown. Uh, the DeWall pile, Fundex pile, Burkle pile, Omega pile. I will not be able to go through the nuances of each of the methods, how it's constructed, but I will talk about 
the commonalities of the approach with the these types of concrete displacement piles. Uh, and keep in mind that both contractors and manufacturers have developed their own specialized tooling uh, based on the needs of the contractor manufacturer as well as their customers, uh, their experiences, and the geologic conditions within uh, in which they work. So each method is slightly different and it has its own little nuances. Um, common, common to all methods, modern hydraulic drilling and piling rigs are able or capable of producing high torque and high crowd forces, which are really needed to achieve the desired pile diameters and depths with, these, uh, with this type of piling. Uh, and keep in mind the maximum achievable depth and diameter, both of which are limited by the capabilities of a drilling rig. And there are three main things that govern this. Uh, the first of which is the pull-up or extraction force. Uh, second is the available rotary torque of the drill rig. And the third of which is the height of the drill mass that is able or that is available through the drill rig. And with each of the methods, there are three main steps that are, or three main components that go into constructing these uh, types of piles. The first of which is the advancement or drilling phase, the second is the extraction or the concreting phase, and the third of which is the insertion of reinforcement when necessary. So first, during the drilling phase, uh, this is where the tool and the drill string are rotated and penetrate the ground using the rotary drive and the crowd force provided by the drill rig, the soil, the in-situ soil, is displaced radially outward into the formation. And this, this portion or this phase continues until the desired depth is achieved. The second phase, uh, this occurs during the extraction and concreting phase. So now we've hit bottom and we're working our way back out. Um, this is where the drill string or continue or for the most part, commonly rotated on the way back out as the drill string and the tubing are extracted. And now grout is injected or concrete is injected into the borehole. Um, the tooling itself through its rotation provides or re results in a relatively smooth borehole wall. And this reduces the concrete overbreak or overconsumption and eliminates over augering as well. In the third part, when needed, there's insertion of steel reinforcement, which can, which can consist of rebar cage, bot steel bars, beams, et cetera. Um, and in most part, the steel reinforcement is installed after the hole has been grouted and all tooling has been removed from the hole itself. Uh, this slide just shows the, the slight differences between tooling offered by two different manufacturers, both of which are from Europe. The details of the tooling are provided down on the lower portion of this slide. And again, the, the tooling and the arrangement diameters limited by the drill rig, as well as the experiences of the manufacturers. Uh, the tooling on the outer portion of the slide, those have been used for denser, harder soils. And the tooling in the middle, uh, those are used for looser or softer formations. So differences based on geology as well. Okay, so what is used for the grout or the uh, concrete as we're working our way back out? Uh, for the most part, the mixes are relatively similar. Uh, there's a Portland cement, there's aggregate, uh, smaller aggregate for a grout mix, if not concrete. There's water, fly ash, and admixtures. Uh, so admixtures are used to, are admixtures affect and they control the rate of hydration. So this is for workability and set time. Water reducers are used as plasticizers and that affects the amount of water needed for fluidity, flowability, pumpability, to make sure we can actually get the mix to where we want it without clogging our lines. 
The other thing to keep in mind is the injection pressures, and this should be uh, established with an on-site pre-production testing bro program to correlate our equipment and our methods to our ground conditions. Uh, larger pressures as we're down deep, reducing as we're coming out closer to the ground surface. And we want to do that to ensure that we don't compromise the integrity of the ground as well as hydrofracture and lose control of our concrete or our grout. Okay, so the next few slides will show a brief case history of a project that was done uh, by an Italian contractor, specialty contractor, Trevi SPA. Uh, this project site is located on the waterfront in Rimini, which is on the northeastern side on the Adriatic coast in Italia. Um, and this project was undertaken to create or develop a mixed-use development of residential and building structures in a rather affluent area. Um, as we can see up on the right hand or on the upper left hand slide, the red outline shows the, uh, the outline of the work site and we can all clearly agree and undoubtedly agree that the working conditions are quite, quite insufferable here. So, <laughs> pardon me. Uh, the, schematic on the left-hand sh side shows the original layout of the foundation for one of these larger structures. And here what we see is uh, the original, oh, let's start with the geology. So the general subsurface condition uh, consisted of a, a variety of heterogene heterogeneous uh, layering uh, comprised, comprising sand, silts, and clays. Um, as we can see in that schematic on the right-hand side, we have a layer of fill, which is underlain by a layer of sand, which is then underlain by another layer of sand, medium coarse, which is then underlain by silt and clays, and continues downward. The blue highlighting within this graphic shows the extent of where the original pile depth um, would have been founded in this geology. So, as part of the original foundation design, the designer estimated for this structure and its loading that approximately 1,600 board piles or driven piles, there would have been a mixture of both, would have been required to support the structure. However, uh, it was deemed that the pile driving operations would have caused excessive uh, noise and vibrations, uh, especially to the nearby residents in surrounding structures. So, there was a concern, there was also a concern uh, that the board pile operations with the use of bentonite slurry as the drilling fluid would also have issues, and this pertained mainly to the cleanliness of the job site, uh, and effect, which would have affected the surrounding roads uh, when the trucks would have been transporting the excavated materials from the site. Uh, so here we see that the issues were not predominantly technical or solely technical, but they were also uh, socially driven as well trying to keep complaining neighbors to a minimum. As an alternative to the conventional piling approach, Trevi offered a solution using unreinforced drill displacement piles uh, that would have been in, to be installed in a diamond-shaped pattern, and this would have been used predominantly for ground improvement beneath the structures, and they would have been combined with a load transfer platform to support the structures and found the building on a shallower foundation scheme to limit the displacements and vertical settlements. The redesigned foundation scheme would have required 1,600 uh, 24 inch diameter unreinforced drill displacement piles, uh, as we said, on a diamond shaped pattern. The length of the piles would vary across the site depending on the geology as well as the imposed loading, and the lengths range from anywhere from 30 to 85 feet. Uh, so total, there was about 85,000 linear feet of piling required, which was more than 20, 
20,000 linear feet over the original. Uh, initially, the owner had some concerns that an unreinforced element, uh, an unreinforced element would have uh, not provided the structural support needed, so a load testing program was produced or undertaken, tested under 176 tons of load, showed minimal displacement both according to the loading as well as in creep. So no further uh, concerns offered by the owner from that point forward. So what were some of the benefits realized? There was a rapid installation uh, uh, due to the use of drill displacement piling. There was also uh, an affordability that project savings were realized, that a month was shaved off the project in total. There were improved soil characteristics, even though uh, it, there was a reduced environmental impact and no complaining neighbors. Changing gears a little bit here, we're going to talk briefly about steel drill displacement piling. The methodology is similar, using a uh, hydraulic drill rig rotating a pile into the ground. And here this, the shape and the tooling itself is quite simple. We're utilizing a 12 and 3 quarter inch steel uh, pipe with a 3 8 wall casing or 3 8 inch wall thickness with a specialized proprietary tip welded on the bottom. And we're installing these to depth as shown on the screen. So what are some of the advantages and benefits of using this type of system? Well, many are similar to what we discussed previously for the concrete drill displacement piles. Uh, we're looking at also installing with conventional equipment. Here, because we're not trying to create an open hole, we're installing, you know, we can install in very loose, runny, or soft soil conditions. We can achieve high product production rates because we're only can keeping connected during installation or uh, penetration into the ground, and then we disconnect from the drill rig and move the drill because we're leaving the pipe in place. Uh, we also have an increased flexibility that we can add lengths as we need to moving forward. Uh, ultimate capacities that have been tested are fairly high for such a small element, so we're looking at the three to 400 kips in stiff clays and 500 to 800 kips in denser sands. Uh, quick project overview case history here. This is a project in Coronado, California for uh, construction of an enlisted bachelor's enlisted facility uh, for some personnel, Navy personnel. Uh, site investigation was performed to get some design criteria, some design parameters. Uh, and the criteria, which was pretty much driven by the operations on the base, which were keep the minimal or keep impacts minimal to operations, mitigate the effects of any potential liquefaction, minimize your vibrations, and try to keep the cost of disposal also to a minimum. So here we have a site that had looser, for the most part, looser, silty sands overlying uh, a loose sand deposit, overlying a medium dense to dense sand condition, which was then underlain by uh, clay to sift, stiff clay or clay to silty clay condition down below. So the original design had called for either using deep foundation system composed of uh, ochre cast in place piling or utilizing vibratory stone columns. Uh, the ochre cast in place piles, they were looking originally to install a minimum of 35 feet into the ground utilizing 16 to 20 inch diameter pile ground modification with the columns, stone columns, looking at extending these down to 50 feet. Um, oh, I need to wrap up so not to take out anybody else's time here. So just to show this, we had, there was an alternative design uh, utilizing 273 piles, design capacity 250 kips. Uh, Cross-section, as discussed earlier, there was static testing performed as well as dynamic testing. 
Uh, all of the testing had shown that the design limit or the design loading of two and a half or 250 kips was achieved with minimal issues, uh, could handle the load and safeguard against the liquefaction. Again, some of the recap uh, takeaways that we had discussed, big caveat with drill displacement piles, need to create the displacing and compacting behavior of the soil because no spoil are coming back to the ground. So thank you for your time and uh, see if there's any questions at this point. Nope, it does not look as such. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marinucci. Uh, this is Luis Garcia again. Uh, we appreciate your presentation, uh, quite interesting. I'm sorry you had to speed it up towards the end. Uh, we will go on to the second presentation now, which is uh, Professor Mohamed Mekawi. Uh, he's assistant professor of the Department of Civil Engineering in Old Dominion University, Norfolk, Virginia. And his topic is on the Virginia Offshore Wind Technology Advancement Project. VOLTAP, Understanding Geotechnical Offshore Wind Practices and Challenges. So with this, please, uh, Mohammed, go ahead. All right, thanks, Luis, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for, for being here. Uh, as Luis indicated, I will be talking about um, the Virginia Offshore Wind Technology Advancement Project, in, in short, VOLTAP. And through that project, we'll give you an overview of what are the geotechnical offshore wind practices are, how they differ from the typical onshore uh, geotech practices that you see every day, and what are some of the general challenges that you need to, to keep in mind. So here is a uh, presentation outline. We'll, we'll briefly go over offshore wind in general, uh, what are some of the recent activities, um, and what are the um, U.S. East Coast specific activities. Um, and then we'll go over the VALTAP project. It has many components, but we'll only focus on the turbine site area. And uh, we'll just sum up with what are the practices and challenges at, at the very end. So the, the bird's eye view is basically how do we move from a wind source that we identify to delivery of an energy to the grid? Um, and how do we move the engineering aspects, which are unfortunately sometimes underappreciated, of sitting, site investigation, variable geology design and installation along with it? And to do that, we have to combine the European offshore wind experience um, together with the oil and gas experience that we have here in the U.S. and combine the two together to push the uh, North American offshore wind uh, forward. So here is a uh, three maps of the recent uh, wind energy area activities along the East Coast. So you have the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Southeast. Every one of those colored shapes is basically a wind energy area that has a developer um, that will develop a, a wind farm uh, in that area. There's a lot of activity in uh, New York and Massachusetts and in the mid-Atlantic area, and there's some also talks about potential wind energy areas in, in, the, in the Carolinas. Um, those don't have developers yet, but they're on the radar for future development. So there's a lot of activities on, on the East Coast, and it looks very promising. If you look at the conditions um, along the East Coast, specifically the water depth, is, is very favorable. So within the first probably 20 to 40 nautical miles, the water depth is relatively shallow. It's 30 meters or less, and if you go further uh, offshore, um, the water depth is um, on the order of 30 to 60 meters. So relatively shallow water with plenty of wind resources um, that would push this industry forward. Um, we do have to, however, deal with hurricane force winds, and that is something that the European industry doesn't have to deal with. Uh, the good news is we have experience in the oil and gas down in the Gulf with hurricane force winds and how to design for that. So that's why we need to bring that knowledge uh, to that industry. The water depth will influence the loading conditions, so what kind of loads are applied to the structure. 
the site investigation methods, what kind of vessel and what kind of, what kind of drilling techniques we're going to have, and the foundation alternatives. So if you look at the bottom schematic in the 30 to 60 meter range, the most likely structures we're going to see in the, along the east coast is probably going to be uh, jacket structures and monopiles with the likelihood of jacket structures being higher. Um, at the west coast where the water uh, gets a lot deeper, a lot quicker, we may see you know, floating type turbines. And there are pilot projects in Italy and Norway and in other places that are looking at the feasibility of, of these structures. The loads that we have to consider are the dead loads of the of the turbine and the tower, all the environmental loads, so wind, wave, and current, and, and ice, um, additional effects like uh, ship impact, scour, marine growth, and, and ice loading. Um, we would typically require to do power capacity calculations, both axial and lateral, to see which one governs and which one is uh, more sent the design is more sensitive to. Uh, drivability analysis. Um, dynamic uh, stiffness of the structure, and then fatigue and cyclic loading. And because of the complexity of these structures uh, and their sensitivity, a lot of the times advanced numerical modeling is, is done. So here's a, a schematic or a map of the, of the project, uh, the Valtap project. It's, a, it's a, a research area, so if you look closely at that image on the right-hand side, there's a, a, an orange rectangle. That's where the two turbines, research turbines, are going to be built. They're going to be monitored for five years. Um, and if they prove to be efficient, then the area behind that, which is delineated by the black rectangle, is going to be developed into an offshore wind farm. Uh, the farm is going to be roughly 24 nautical miles offshore of Virginia Beach in Virginia. And the two research towers are going to support a six megawatt turbine, and those are considered the six megawatt turbines are considered uh, on the high end of, of turbines manufactured uh, nowadays. There are talks about uh, eight and ten megawatt turbines, but the six megawatt is one of the largest uh, right now. It is going to be supported on an IBGS substructure, which stands for an inward battered guide structure. Uh, developed by a company in the U.S. called Keystone. It's a very clever design. It's a lightweight uh, jacket uh, that's supposed to be uh, more fatigue resistant and definitely has a lot of lot less elements and joints. So what we did for this project is uh, a site investigation, a geophysical survey, uh, standard and advanced lab testing, and engineering design. So here, again, is a picture of what the structure will look like with the uh, GE Alstom 6-megawatt uh, turbine. Uh, it has a 151-meter diameter, the rotor diameter, and it spins at 4 to 11.5 RPMs. The rotor, the nacelle, and the blades weigh 440 tons, and the turbine is going to sit about 100 meters above the sea level, and that gives you an idea of the magnitude of, of these types of structures. Um, the tower diameter is 6 meters at the base, 4 meters at the top, and it weighs 380 tons. On the right-hand side, you see a, a, a photo of the IBGS, or the twisted jacket. It's uh, uh, supported by three battered piles that are going to be 1.5 meters in diameter, with, and a central caisson driven a lot shallower than the piles that is 2.74 meters in, in diameter. So you can see that the, it's a relatively light, lightweight structure. Um, and it's going to support a very heavy uh, wind turbine. So most of the offshore wind turbines are very sensitive to uh, changes in lateral soil behavior. Uh, however, this structure is slightly different. Because of the loads and because of the uh, large turbine and relatively light jacket structure and the battered piles, it is actually sensitive to changes in soil properties along the axial direction. So if you think of the soil structure interaction by representing soils with springs, the TZ spring for the axial load transfer, the PY spring for the lateral load transfer, and you look at the first mode of frequency under original soil conditions, it's about 0.25 or 0.26. If you double the, the ultimate soil resistance, so run the same analysis with 2P, you find that the first mode of frequency changes by about 0.37%, which is not a lot. If you do the same for the shear resistance and run the analysis with 2T, 
you'll find that the frequency, the first motor frequency changes by 1.3%. So this structure is, is sensitive to changes in the sole properties along the axial direction, not like monopiles where the lateral behavior is more important. So why is that important? So we have to define a few things here in, for, in order for us to understand why is that important. Um, the two things that we need to remember are the uh, rotor frequency, which is termed the 1P frequency, and the blade passing frequency, which is a th term the, called the 3P frequency. The 3P frequency, basically, if you look at the schematic on the, on the right-hand side, there's the wind load distribution along the tower. And every time one of the blades pass in front of the tower, it causes a shadowing effect and it changes the wind load distribution on the tower. So this cyclic change causes another frequency, which we call the 3P frequency. So if we present that on a diagram, we have the probability density uh, spectrum versus frequency. You have the distribution of wind and waves. Um, the wind, uh, the wave here is more of a, a wave period of about six to 10 seconds, which is typical for the East Coast. And then you have the 1P rotor frequency, which is the uh, red region on the left-hand side and the 3P blade passing frequency to the right. And those are the no-go zones. We don't want to be close to those regions. We cannot really design a offshore turbine to fall within a frequency range in the soft, soft uh, zone because that becomes a very flexible structure and it becomes impractical to design it. And the same applies to the stiff, stiff zone, which becomes a very rigid and an uneconomic uh, structure. So that leaves us with the gray zone, which we uh, describe as the soft, stiff response. And if you look at the first motor frequency for the IBGS, it really falls very close to the 1P no-go zone uh, of the rotor frequency. So if you have a uh, strain-hardening soil, you want to design the frequency of the structure to be closer to 1P. If you have strain-softening soil, you want to design it to be closer to the 3P frequency. And if you're doing a conceptual design and you're uncertain what the conditions are, you want to be at the center. So here's a map of where the project is. You have the turbine sites, which is the focus of this presentation today the export, uh, offshore export cable, which is about 24 nautical miles, and then the HDD nearshore export cable route. So again, our focus is on, going to only be on the two turbines that are inside the, that uh, orange rectangular area. So the scope was to review the geophysical data that was there available at the site, drill four borings, um, and pick the two with the best foundation soils and use those for the locations of the jacket structures and towers and design uh, the foundations. We had to bring a uh, jack up from the, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to Virginia uh, to drill the site. And as we drill, we do pilot capacity calculations with the pile head loads that are shown at the bottom of the slide. So we have the compression and tension of 30 and 27 mega newtons, and we increase those by 30 to 40 percent just to be conservative, and you probably add another uh, four pile diameters of scour, and you start drilling and doing your pile capacity calculations on real time. And once you achieve the pile head loads that you, that you have in your design, then that's when you stop and terminate the boreholes. Um, we also have to implement a protected species observation program. You won't, don't want to create a lot of noise, especially with the geophysical campaign and disturb the mammals, and then advanced laboratory testing after that. So let's take a closer look at the geophysical data that's available at the turbine site. What I'm showing here is multi-beam geophysical data. And multi-beam, without going into a lot of details of, of what the technique is, it's an improvement of uh, simply dropping a lead line uh, and measuring what the water depth is. These are beams that radi radiate from a source. They ping the seafloor in return, and they give us an idea about the water depth and uh, the features on the seafloor. So if you look at the turbine uh, site, which has the four borings here, the three that we drilled, and then we skipped the fourth one because the soil conditions were all the same, um, you immediately see a hazard. And that hazard is 
to the north of the turbine site, and I'm just showing these arrows to uh, show you where that hazard is. Well, it turns out that the, the, there are mobile sand waves that are migrating towards the turbine site. So we went back and we looked at multi-beam data, multi-beam echo sounder data from previous years that have been uh, collected at the same spot. And we found that these sand waves are actually mobile they're migrating at a rate of about 4 to 13 meters. The closest one is roughly 100 meters away. So conservatively, if we pick 13 meters per year of migration rate, then in about nine years, those sand, that sand wave field will be at the turbine site. And it has the potential of raising the seafloor by 2.5 meters, and they have a wavelength of 60 meters. So they can... Um, affect the first motor frequency of the structures. And that, by looking at the geophysics alone, triggered a study on understanding the impact of sand wave migrations on, on this type of structure that we were installing here. Uh, some of the things to keep in mind when you're looking at the site investigation is positioning. You know, positioning is, is very important. You don't have landmarks, so you have to rely on a differential global positioning system with submeter accuracy um, because a lot of the times the tolerance on where you're going to drill and where you're going to do your CPTs is less than one meter. Um, you also have to perform a 360-degree sonar survey before and after drilling. A lot of the times you're drilling in pioneer areas, especially in offshore wind, and you don't know what's down on the seafloor. There could be shipwrecks, there could be uneven seafloor or a boulder field in the, in the northeast where the, most of the areas have been glaciated. So you want to drop the legs of the jack, and the, of the jack up in an area that's uh, relatively benign and doesn't have any obstructions. And also sometimes we do a 360 degree sonar after we're done drilling, and you can see from the bottom right, uh, that the 8-inch borehole is visible. We do uh, slightly different um, drilling techniques. So what I'm showing you here is uh, marine-style downhole CPTs and uh, sample and, and thin wall uh, Shelby tubes that we throw at the bottom of the borehole and we use to do alternating CPTs and um, sampling. We also combine those techniques with uh, the PS suspension logging system, which is very similar to your uh, seismic CPT test. Um, that's a tool that's also dropped at the bottom of the borehole and raised in one meter increment. And by exciting the source, we measure the shear wave velocity at two uh, receivers that are one meter apart. So we start from the bottom of the borehole and incrementally raise it until we get to the top as we raise the casing with the uh, PS suspension tool. So that gives us a really um, dense borehole log that looks slightly different than what you typically see uh, onshore. So you have the standard uh, index testing and undrained shear strength plus the undrained shear strength you get from the CPT, all the CPT parameters like relative density and a friction angle, in addition to the PS suspension logging data that has the bulk modulus, the shear modulus, the Poisson's ratio. So you have a wealth of data that's very much needed to uh, design these complex structures. Uh, we typically perform lab testing on the vessel, and uh, some of the lab testing we do are the mini veins and moisture and index testing and the UUs, and we leave the more complicated uh, testing to do that onshore, like dynamic testing and consolidation. We survey all the, all the safe tubes and pick the uh, areas or the, the sections of the tube that are undisturbed for the consolidation on dynamic testing, and the disturbed zones can be, you know, we can probably do things like Atterberg and moisture in those, in those zones. Um, dynamic soil properties are important because as we uh, just discussed, they may influence the frequency of the structure. So it's very important to define the changes of shear modulus versus strain, which is that red curve I'm showing. Um, so we have a range of dynamic testing like resident column and uh, triaxial and direct shears to be able to fully define that curve, um, and not only versus strain, but also versus number of cycles, because that's a direct input in the finite element analysis that we do for these types of projects. This is an example of a multi-stage uh, test, a cyclic direct simple shear test on a sand sample that's 35 meters below the seafloor. 
Um, it has a frequency, or it was tested at a frequency of 0.25 hertz, uh, 1,500, num- uh, 1500 uh, cycles with a two-way loading. And we had a, a pre-shear drained uh, cycle of 900, uh, of 400 cycles to simulate pile driving. Um, and the idea is to show you that you know these tests are are done in a multi-stage as opposed to a multi-specimen like you do uh, on shore. So uh, to summarize what we we've talked, I know I've, I've went through a lot of things, but the idea was to give you a flavor of what is done offshore and how it's different. Um, we have very encouraging activities uh, off for related to offshore wind along the East Coast. There are other activities in the West Coast and in the Great Lakes and also in Hawaii. Um, when we work offshore, marine drilling is the best technique, so we don't typically rely on SPT type drilling. Uh, we also rely on in-situ testing a lot. So wire, wire line drilling, downhole, and seabed CPTs are uh, some of the uh, marine style uh, techniques that we use. It is very important to integrate the geotechnical and geophysical data together to evaluate all the geohazards. Um, understand the short and long-term dynamic flow properties is very important uh, because they do change the first mode of frequency. They can push us towards the no-go zones of the 1P and 3P uh, frequencies. And then finally, some of the challenges. Um, one is vessel availability. For this project, we had to bring a vessel from the Gulf. Uh, the mobilization and demobilization is very expensive. Uh, and whether you bring a jack up or a drilling vessel um, from the Gulf or from Europe it is going to be commercially, um, you know, the, your, your project has to be able to handle that commercially. There are potential for, uh, for obstructions. There has not been a lot of drilling activity in the East Coast. So again, this is, uh, this is something that we have to account for. It might be obstructions or artifacts or, or UXOs. So surveying, geophysical surveying is very important. And then finally, uh, the laboratory tests is a significant component of the project. Uh, the dynamic uh, testing specifically takes time. It, it's slow. It uh, happens after you're, fin- you're done with all the standard testing, so it may add to the schedule of the project. Um, there are not a lot of labs commercially that can handle these sophisticated tests, um, so that, again, may extend the project schedule. You're going to compete over lab space with oil and gas projects uh, that typically also happen during the summertime where most of the drilling takes place anyway. And then you have to coordinate your cyclic testing with the structural designer so you make sure you're applying uh, the right frequency, the right number of cycles, and define failure uh, the way the structural designer understands what failure is. And then finally, how do we design for extreme events? Uh, this is something unique to the East Coast. Uh, we have nor'easters, we have hurricanes here. This is something that the European offshore wind market doesn't deal with. But like I said, if we bring the knowledge from the Gulf of Mexico to this industry, we should be able to handle that. And with that, I'm going to stop and uh, thank uh, you know the companies listed below, Dominion, Fugro, McNeil, and Keystone, for allowing me to show some of the photos and data uh, from that project, and then open up the floor for questions. The the first question is, uh, is there a list of references for this project as well as the topic? Has this work been published? Um, there is not a list of references. The Just so you understand, the work that's being done for offshore wind is public. Um, so the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has uh, all these reports, and you can request uh, the reports from them. Um, if you reach out uh, to them uh, or to me, I'd be happy to coordinate that and get you all the information um, that, that has been done. Uh, another question is, how do you estimate the soil parameters, SPT blow counts, uh, after installation of DD pile? I think that was a question to the previous presentation. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, you know the displacement pile was for the pre- previous presentation. That's correct, uh, Mohammed. Uh, I would like to ask at this time if, if uh, Antonio Marinucci is still in, and maybe he can respond to that first question that came in after he finished. Antonio? Okay, he he may not be in now. So, uh, Mohammed, I, I thank you a lot for a very interesting presentation. If there is a, any questions, uh, we still have uh, one or two minutes within the time allotted for this presentation. So, 
would be welcome to uh, write it up and then we can uh, consider it. Uh, I guess, there uh, is... No, the questions have come up. Yeah, there's Therefore, another question uh, here. Mohammed, uh, I thank you again. And uh, we're going to be moving to our uh, third presentation, which is uh, Rospet Mogadan, GRL Engineers. And uh, Rospet is going to talk to us about drivability analysis and friction fatigue for large open ended pipe piles supporting offshore oil platforms. Thank you, Luis, for the uh, introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. It always is a pleasure, and I'd like to thank GEO Institute and Deep Foundation Technical Committee for their efforts to make these webinars take place. So as Luis mentioned, uh, I'm happy to talk about drivability analysis and friction fatigue and the impact of this event on uh, open-ended pipe piles for, mainly for offshore platforms. Um, we're going to go ahead and have a quick review of the foundations, load transfer, and the common terminologies used in the design of deep foundations, and then further we're going to transition towards the uh, friction fatigue concept and the studies that has been done so far on this event, and then I will present a, a study where uh, the drivability analysis has been taking place using uh, friction fatigue and without friction fatigue, and then we're going to compare the blow counts. Um, when we talk about um, deep foundations and uh, the loads that are applied to deep foundations, it's always good to know the basic terminologies uh, that is used for for design. So uh, we are commonly referred to head or top uh, load at the foundations, and we have the shaft resistance, the skin resistance, or side resistance, and also the tip, base, point, and or toe resistance that are referred to the uh, source of resistance in deep foundations. Now, how the load is transferred to these foundations uh, and how the ultimate capacity is predicted, well, there is a different ways and different approaches, and mainly the source of resistance is coming from the shaft resistance and the base resistance, and the disc these two will yield the uh, ultimate capacity. Now, if the approach is on the serviceability uh, side, then the pile head settlement it will govern the design. So it should be less than the tolerable settlement in order to have a serviceable pile or a pile that is uh, satisfactory or the, the performance is satisfactory based on serviceability. Now, here it's just shown on the uh, factor of safety or the allowable stress design. Um, it's not mentioned anything about LRFD, which is a different concept. So we're going to continue with, with the concept of the allowable stress design for this, for this map. Now, when we talk about pile design in sand, we can uh, mostly refer to the load mechanism and how the loads are transferred to the shaft. And then when we want to define or calculate the skim friction or shaft resistance in sand, we usually determine the unit shaft resistance using the beta method or is the product of the lateral earth uh, coefficient times the tan delta, delta being the angle uh, between the soil and the pile uh, element. Now, the concept of pile driving through sand is uh, dependent or directly related to the conditions of sand when we are uh, strictly talking about sand. So for a loose sand, we'll have a different type of driving. For a depth sand, we'll have a different type of driving. And to illustrate that, I have put together some, um, you know, subway system. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I think, well, the slides are reversed, but um, if we have a, a pile type, uh, I mean, the type of pile to be installed in certain type of sand, the K value is going to be an indicative of how much shaft resistance we're going to have for that pile. For example, in the fully displacement piles, um, you know, the greater uh, the, the um, greater K, you have a smaller displacement, and then for greater, if the K is approximately equal to the K naught, you will have a uh, easy driving or driving through loose sand. Now, what is the K at the end of driving? That is a, a good concept to, to be studied because after the, the sand is um, molded or displaced or modified, you will have a different K value than the initial one. So to illustrate that, again, now I have like this uh, analogies shown in this photos, like when you have the K approximately equal to the K naught at the uh, initial conditions, then it's talking about loose sand, and then relatively, when the pile is driven, can pass through before the sand gets densified, whereas if you have uh, dense sand, the K is going to be larger than K naught, and then you're going to have a, a little bit more resistance uh, for the pile drive. And obviously, if we have an extreme dense sand or we have a very dense sand, this will be a condition where, you know, pile driving, if this person that is shown here tries to displace all the way down to take this train card instead of the ones right here, you're going to have way more difficulty to go through. And every time that he's going through this path, you're going to be disturbing the people around himself. So basically, when this particle tries to move, it tries to uh, pass through this dense uh, sand, you're going to create lots of uh, resistance. So now if we talk about clays, things get a little bit easier where we just use the alpha value or the alpha approach and the undrained shear strength of the clay. So there is a limited research done on clays in general. It's not uh, a uh, vast understandable concept as the um, stands are. So the approach for the unit shaft resistance is with the alpha value where it is a reduction of the undrained shear strength. And when we are determining the base resistance, we can use the 9SU or the NQ value multiplied by the uh, effective vertical stress at the base. So the NQ value, the burn capacity factor is for use for the sand and the 9 SU is primarily used for clays. This is an API method. Now, in, in, in general, the concepts that I was trying to show up to this slide was just a quick review and just a quick understanding of the terminology and the methods existing for uh, the design of uh, piles in sand and in clay. Now, why I included these is because when we get to the concept of friction fatigue and the uh, case study that I'm showing here, we will be talking about the beta value, the alpha value, and uh, primarily shaft resistance in piles. Now, when we start to talk about the concept of friction fatigue, um, if a pile basically is driven into the ground, there is two concepts to be considered. When we talk about open-ended pie pile, one concept is uh, when the pile is driven into the ground, the soil particle start to shear and shear and shear multiple times until the pile uh, reaches the, uh, the final depth of penetration. When we talk about offshore piles, these piles are usually very long and obviously larger diameters compared to the ones that is used onshore and it takes thousands of blow counts to reach the uh, final penetration depth. So due to those blow counts, each soil particle near the shaft perimeter 
going to be sheared and sheared again and sheared again, and it's going to create the concept of friction fatigue. That's the number one. Number two, the model that we're going to use, uh, we're going to show here today, also takes into account the internal friction when the plug happens in an open ended pipe pile. So basically, in this uh, slide, is showing T1 where I have the initial part of uh, we're going to drive this pile, and is T equal to 1. And the penetration depth is equals to plug length, so the PLR, the plug length ratio, equals to 1. As we advance this pile and we go to the next penetration depth, you still the penetration depth is the same as the plug length. You still have a PLR of 1 and then so on until it plugs, and then in the next case you have the penetration depth of eight meters where the plug length is seven meters, so the PLR start to uh, decrease. So with this decrease of the PLR, you have a plugging effect happening in this uh, open in the pie pile, and at the same time, you're increasing the shaft resistance from in the inside of the pile, or you starting to have a shaft resistance inside of the pile as well. The second concept to, to uh, note here is at time five and time six, that plug length has passed uh, the sole particle marked in this slide, uh, this slide uh, uh, as A, the sole particle A. So after, after X amount of blow counts, this sole particle A has been multiple, sheared multiple times. So when, when that happens, what happens to, to the sole particle? Well, at the beginning of the uh, driving, looks like this owl, where people are excited to go to engineering school, and as the pile is driven and driven and driven and finally reaches the final depth of penetration, this soil particle A feels like it's about to finish engineering school, whereas soil B, which is very close or almost beneath the tip of the pile is still fresh. So this is the, the concept of friction fatigue in this schematic way to take a look at it. Now, the first person to study this concept was uh, Hirema or Hirema in 1974, where based on some observations in Belgium, uh, they realized that as you drive the pile to um, higher depth of penetration, the expected event is that the drivability will increase as well because there is more shaft resistance. Because when we do a long-term static resistance analysis for shaft resistance, as the depth increases, usually the shaft resistance increases as well. But during the driving uh, the, the piles, he observed that that was not true and the resistance was dropping down in a nonlinear form as the depth of the pile was increasing. So he decided to create a uh, lab setup to shear a, uh, un an undisturbed sample through multiple cycles and he decided to record or uh, take note of the shear strength. So then he created the plot shown on the left, and the y-axis is the um, skin resistance or friction resistance in kilonewton square meter, and in the x-axis is the number of oscillations. As you can see, as the oscillation was going up to 100 oscillations, gradually the friction uh, resistance started to drop, and then you have an, an, an increase, is a very small increase, and then further decrease until after 500 oscillations, it, it appeared to be like a constant uh, resistance. So that was something that he observed, and based on this observations and observations from, taken from the field, he determined or he proposed a model to be applied, a mathematical or a predictive model based on empirical data to predict the drivability and how uh, the skin friction in these uh, driven piles will reduce during driving and how that effect would be. So he started to study this with the uh, main model uh, proposed at the 
uh, skin friction resistance, FS, which um, the approach was, okay, the FS is the uh, combination of FS residual and the combination of FS initial, where residual is referred to in this particular study was during the uh, friction resistance during the driving, and the initial was the static long-term uh, resistance. So based on these two parameters, he created the model, and the shape factor for the model was directly correlated to cone penetration data, to the tip resistance on the CPT uh, determined at the site or at the, at the, at the um, pile driving site. So then he correlated the uh, values and divided it for clays and sand. So in case of clays, we have the, uh, on the residual, which is, again, the residual will be during driving. Uh, he correlated to a QT in function of uh, uh, initial vertical stress. And for the initial, he directly takes the CPT sleep friction. So he gets the FSI, which is the initial shaft resistance, skin resistance, and base and gets FS rest, which is the residual based on the tip resistance and the vertical effective stress. And the relation between these two, FSI over FS rest, will give you the setup factor for this particular case. Now, in case of the SANS, he does utilize the K uh, sigma prime naught tan delta or the beta uh, approach, but the difference is the K sigma prime naught in this particular case is in function of the tip resistance, atmospheric pressure, and the initial effective stress of the depth of test. And then for the residual stress, in case of SANS, he empirically accounts with 20% of the initial and he determines the setup factor from the relation between FSI and FS residual. Now, he applied this uh, model determined for uh, the platforms that he was, uh, or they were, I'm sorry, they were um, studying, and he applied those to multiple um, driving records, like uh, he, in this, um, These graphs is showing like a very thin, the, the thinner lines and the, 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 uh, the thinner lines are showing the drivability record and uh, the resistance, I'm sorry, the resistance distribution and the uh, thicker lines are showing the model that was developed by, by Almond Hammer. So basically they observed the driving record, they observed the resistance distribution and they fitted a model to this result to create an empirical model. So what we have done is apply this model to a drivability analysis that it was recently um, performed for a project. Um, the uh, property, the pile properties are shown on the top right, 1.676 meter diameter high piles open ended. 184.2 meter total length, 119 meters of penetration. And the hammer that it was used for this project was a Menk MHU 500. So we took the data, we used a wave equation program, and we determined the drivability based on without friction fatigue, with friction fatigue, taking the K value as a constant. K value, again, is the setup factor. Uh, I'm sorry, the shape factor constant throughout the all analysis, and we used the almond hammer with different shape factor. I mean, the shape factor was calculated for each layer of soil. So if we put those in the table form, we can see here, okay, for the, uh, when we have the model that is without friction fatigue, um, I'm sorry, with friction fatigue, but we're using an, a, a shape factor constant, we have a setup factor, which is LTSR, long-term static resistance, divided by the uh, static resistance during driving, SRD, 
which this will be equivalent of what Almond Hammer called it FSI and FSRES. FSI will be the LTSR and FSRES will be the SRD. And when we're not using the friction, uh, we're not using the Almond Hammer uh, model. We're using the uh, recommended values on the WEEP uh, or the Wave Equation program of one and two, two for clays, one for sand, and the shape factor. In this case, we in, in, in the input of the program, you enter zero at this side at this point, but the value is a constant of point. 01. That is the K value or uh, the shape uh, value. Now, when we use the almond hammer, the setup factor is determined from the FSI and FSRES. So, the setup factor, the first column you see, instead of having 1, 1.5, or 2, now you can observe that you have 5, 4, 2.2, 53, 27. So, because in this case, is not only depending on the type of soil, or the properties uh, determined for the soil, in this case, is directly calculated for each layer uh, at, at, at the corresponding depth. Similarly, the shape factor is determined for each layer based on the tip resistance that it was determined from the uh, uh, cone penetration test. So we have um, modeled the pile. As you can see here, we have the batter pile, we have the jacket, um, cushions and hammers, and then the splices locations, and then the API method to determine the static resistance, uh, the base and shaft, and then we input the properties for the pile itself, such as the module of elasticity, um, unit weight, and the location of the splices. And then when we're going to introduce the almond hammer, we have to have uh, a, a, a detailed calculation for the K value and the shape factor. So again, uh, the K value is determined based on CPT test that it was done at the location of the project, and the shape factor is determined based on the tip resistance of the CPT as well. Now, after we do the analysis, the results show very similar to what Almond Hammer was suggesting in, in, in their study, as the pile goes deeper and deeper, the uh, shaft resistance, or the unit shaft resistance, decreases. So as you can see, uh, yellow dotted line is where uh, the pile was driven to 30 meters, whereas the red one is at 119 meters. And every time in between, such as at uh, 30, 38, 30 meters, 60 meters, and 85 meters, every time you look at that um, depth, you can see a reduction of uh, shaft resistance. And you can observe this in all um, almond hammer model, and you can observe this in the, in the uh, weak, uh, wave equation program without almond hammer. Now, the difference is the almond hammer, how does, um, the, the, the main question is how does almond hammer uh, matches the drivability? Well, after we saw the reduction in the skin friction, the next thing is we had a record of, of, uh, of the blow counts or the driving record, and we observed that with the almond hammer model, which is the red model shown in the right, in the figure to the right, you can observe that almond hammer model goes along with the blow counts when it gets deeper and deeper. So the first 40 meters, uh, the first maybe 60 meters, up to 60 meters, you can see a, a good uh, comparison between all the three models. But as it gets deeper and deeper, the two other models start to overpredict because they follow a constant shape factor, and they consider that every time they get to the tip of the pile, automatically the resistance goes to the LTSR long term, whereas the almond hammer, because it has a more precise uh, measurement between tip of the pile and the next soil particle because of the shape factor, it shows a more consistent model or a more consistent drivability uh, with the reality with what is measured. Uh, in this 
figure to the right, the, the, the green uh, graph, a green plot represents the actual measured blow counts, and the other three solid ones, it represents the predicted drivability based on a wave equation uh, program. Now, you know, in general, uh, after or in, in summary, you know, using a constant shape factor for a drivability analysis, it could give a over prediction for the blow counts and it could give the impression that you need more blow counts. So incorporating the Allman Hammer model in the drivability analysis to predict blow counts required to pass through the soil layers, uh, it seems to be more uh, applicable than the other models. And I think with that, I will like to turn it to questions and answers and I'd be more than happy to answer if there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, this is Luis Garcia again. I don't see any uh, technical questions uh, for uh, Rospeth. Uh, there's one comment. Uh, Rospeth, do you see it in the uh, questions? Safe questions? On the safe questions, yes. Yes, it is part, I understand. And um, the, this is not a technical question. I, I, would, I would be more than happy to answer this question, but it's not related to drivability. It's okay. the, the, the way we, just to have a broad comment, the way we receive the information from our client is the way we present it. So it's not. Uh, I cannot modify what they do. Very well. Uh, Rospeth, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. And uh, we, we do have uh, some minutes left uh, for your time. Uh, if there's any other questions, but I don't see anything coming in. So if uh -huh. anyone comes up with a question and we're still around at the end of the presentation, we may entertain those uh, answers to those questions. So again, thank you very much, and let's move on to uh, our last presentation, last but not least, uh, our presenter is uh, James Niehoff, uh, PE, a member of ASE from GEI Consultants. Uh, Mr. Niehoff is going to be presenting us on the use of deflection-based site shear and end bearing relationships in CFA pile design to predict performance and ultimate capacity. Uh, Jim, you can. Go ahead. Thank you, Luis. Uh, good afternoon to those who are in the East Coast, and uh, good morning to those who are further west. Uh, this particular topic is one that I've been very interested in for some time because the most uh, analyses uh, of design uh, relate to ultimate capacity as, com as it compared to deflection-based capacity. Uh, the ultimate Capacity uh, is a very, very applicable method to uh, short piles, but uh, not as applicable to long piles, and that's what I'll be getting into today. Uh, just a, a brief outline. Uh, we're going to talk just uh, very generally about uh, CFA piles. Uh, some of the previous presentations this morning have, have discussed this, so I'm not going to linger on that very long, but uh, just go through it rather quickly. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, again very br briefly about uh, traditional uh, pile design methods. And then ask the question, uh, do current design methods properly assess uh, load transfer and support? Then I'm going to introduce uh, deflection-based uh, procedures uh, that, that I've been using for some time. There are some accept accepted methods out there, but most uh, methods uh, that are being used currently uh, are based on ultimate uh, capacity uh, divided by some safety factor. Then I'm going to go through a case history to sort of illustrate uh, how we can practically use uh, this information uh, to uh, perhaps better design foundations. So very briefly, uh, CFA piles, which are uh, uh, continuous flight auger piles, are a uh, cast-in-place uh, pile type of a system. 
Uh, the diameters uh, typically range from uh, 12 to 24 inches, although in some cases uh, uh, these piles can uh, range up to one meter in diameter. Uh, in typical installation depths uh, are up to about 120 feet, but again, uh, with uh, some types of equipment, uh, we can exceed uh, that depth as well. And load capacities, uh, particularly for some of the larger uh, diameter uh, CFA piles, uh, can range all the way up to uh, a thousand kips. Okay, what are some of the uh, uh, continuous flight auger pile features? Well, generally they offer a higher uh, side shear resistance than uh, driven piles. Most driven piles are quite smooth, whether they be uh, uh, steel or concrete. They have smooth sides. So they, they tend to have a lower coefficient of friction uh, between the pile and the surrounding foundation material. They uh, create less noise and vibration than uh, driven piles. They can be installed below the water table without casing, which is a, a big point between uh, CFA type piles and uh, say drilled shaft foundations. They're generally very competitive in cost, uh, partly because the, uh, they're basically designed in the ground so that they can be uh, installed to very specific depths, uh, as opposed to a driven pile, which uh, uh, comes in in uh, preformed uh, depths. And as uh, we learned earlier in a, in a previous presentation, uh, displacement uh, CFA piles uh, can not only uh, support uh, high loads, but can be used to improve ground conditions. And uh, particularly, they can densify uh, soil and, and lessen uh, liquefaction potential. Okay, looking at the traditional auger cast piles, uh, they're first uh, drilled into the ground when the logger, and then uh, as the auger is withdrawn, uh, concrete is uh, placed uh, directly in the board hole. After the uh, uh, grouting uh, or concreting of the hole takes place, the uh, uh, steel reinforcing cage can be lowered into the ground. And those uh, steel reinforcing cages sometimes will go full length if it's a tension pile, but more often, uh, only extend down to the point of uh, uh, where the bending uh, requirement of the pile is, is exhibited. Now, if we look at a, uh, a pile that's been excavated, uh, which we can see in the uh, photograph on the right, you can see how irregular that pile is. It's still a cylindrical shape, uh, but it has uh, undulations in it. And that those undulations, uh, truly increase the, the side shear resistance of that pile and the surrounding material. As we learned earlier, uh, displacement auger cast piles are very similar to uh, conventional CFA piles except all the cuttings stay in the ground. And uh, again, uh, as was noted earlier, there are different types of uh, displacement auger cast pile. This one again is a uh, DeWall pile. Uh, which has a lower flight, uh, which uh, pushes the cuttings up uh, upward. Uh, it hits a displacing element, and that displacing element uh, uh, prevents the cuttings from going any further. Anything that does work its way past the displacing element hits a reversed uh, flight section, uh, which pushes the cuttings into the sidewalls. So just looking at that, uh, uh, on this diagram, you can see where the cuttings are being pushed up uh, to the displacing element and then uh, pushed out into the side walls, which uh, significantly increases uh, the side shear of these uh, pile types. Now let's go back to uh, basic uh, technology in determining uh, pile support. Uh, again, has been, uh, has been uh, mentioned in previous uh, talks uh, capacity is derived both from uh, side shear and from end bearing. And generally speaking, we add those two components, uh, oftentimes with uh, some sort of a safety factor, 
Uh, typically for side shear, we use a safety factor of two, and for end bearing, uh, we will often use a safety factor of three. So the current design practice uh, is based on the assessment of the ultimate capacity, both in side shear and end bearing. And again, they're multiplied or divided by various safety factors. And that uh, technique is used in many of the, the common procedures, whether it be AASHTO or uh, uh, other, other methods, uh, all typically use an ultimate capacity. And whether, whether we use an, uh, an LRFD method where the uh, safety factors applied in different areas, but uh, ultimately um, the capacity is, is derived from an ultimate strength uh, divided by some value. Let's look at these components individually. Side shear is a function of the composition and density of the subsurface materials, uh, the borehole roughness, and uh, grout pressures used in uh, uh, creating these uh, CFA piles. For medium dense to dense sands, uh, we typically get uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds per square foot of uh, design capacity uh, for uh, CFA piles. Now that may increase somewhat to, to say 3,000 PSF uh, for the displacement auger cast piles. For clays, we look at uh, typically about 50% uh, of the cohesion of the uh, clay soil is used uh, as the ultimate capacity uh, for uh, CFA piles. In weathered rock, uh, we can get uh, 4 to 8 KSF. In a weak limestone, which uh, has a lot of uh, buds in it, uh, holes in it, the, the grout uh, penetrates that better. Even though the, the rock may be somewhat weak, uh, we get uh, quite high size shear capacities, uh, sometimes in the range of 8 to 12 KSF. And for hard igneous rock, it's not unusual to see side shear capacities as high as uh, 50 KSF. Now what have we learned from uh, load tests uh, as far as side shear and uh, looking at end bearing? Well, if we look at these two graphs, uh, these give us uh, sort of a, a typical uh, demonstration of how much movement is required to generate both uh, side shear and end bearing. If you look at the uh, side shear capacity, depending on the density of the material, uh, we, we get a family of curves. but most of those curves, we see the vast majority of uh, side shear is developed uh, with very, very small uh, movements. In some cases, uh, about uh, an eighth of an inch or so, uh, somewhat higher than that perhaps. Uh, we get the vast majority of side shear at very, very low uh, movements of the, of the pile. On the other hand, uh, end bearing is a much more gradual, uh, uh, get a much more gradual increase in load. And in most cases, it, it may be an inch or more before we fully generate or generate even a large uh, uh, percentage of the end bearing capacity. So as we can see, uh, so there is some strain incompatibility between uh, load transfer, uh, between side shear and end bearing, with side shear taking very low movements uh, to generate large values and large movements required to generate end bearing. Now, in addition to that, we have a second compatibility problem. If we look at a typical pile, we're applying load to the, the top of that pile, and that pile is going to deform elastically. Now, we look at the very top of the pile, the, the first segment that we're looking at at the top, it's feeling the full effects of the applied load. So therefore, that upper segment of the pile is, is uh, compressing the most elastically. As we go further down, the, the pile sheds more and more load in side shear. So therefore, the segments below that upper segment are deforming less. So by the time we reach the, the base of the pile, a substantial amount of the load has been taken off in side shear, so that lower segment is only subjected to a very small a compressive force, so therefore deforms the least elastically. 
So what we often see is then that the upper part of the pile deforms significantly, while the lower part of the pile only deforms a small amount. And as a result, we're getting far more movement at the top of the pile than we are at the bottom of the pile. And as we had discussed before, side shear occurs with very small pile movements, whereas end bearing requires large pile movements. So not only do we have a, a strain incompatibility as to when load is, is being generated, but we also see that a pile is going to move more at the top than it will at the bottom. So what are factors of safety that we're really talking about here? So let's look at a typical pile. And let's start at the left part here. The base moves the least of, of any segment of the pile. And yet, because of the, the way that the end bearing occurs, we're generating very little of the end bearing capacity. So we have an extremely high factor of safety on end bearing. Now, about halfway through the pile, we're into stiffer material, and we're getting a side shear coming off there in the middle section of the pile, and there we may have a safety factor of two. The top part of the pile, which is moving the most, we've basically exceeded the deflection of the top part of the pile relative to side shear, so the safety factor of the top of the pile relative to side shear might be one. So most design methods, again, are basically attributing the same safety factor along the entire length of the pile, when in reality, the pile is generating different percentages of side shear from top to bottom, and the end bearing is, is barely moving, uh, so you're getting very little end bearing capacity. So looking at actual load transfer versus design methods, the actual factor of safety of side resistance varies along the length of the pile. It may be close to one near the top and two to three toward the base again, because of the difference in deflection of the pile relative to the foundation materials. For medium to long piles, little if any load typically reaches the pile tip. Significant end bearing capacity may not be realized before the pile exceeds the full capacity in side shear. So again, in traditional methods, they don't consider the effect of the length of the pile on the load transfer characteristics. Again, typically the same safety factor is used for side shear from top to bottom. And they can't be used to accurately predict pile deflections. We, we may know what the ultimate capacity is, but it doesn't really tell us how much is that pile going to move. Is a 10-foot long pile going to move as much as a 40-foot pile? or 50-foot pile or 70-foot pile. None of the traditional methods really analyze pile deflections. So now a deflection-based uh, methodology is not a new approach. Uh, it's originally formulated in the 1950s. Uh, the API, in particular, uh, has a fairly uh, detailed method uh, for analyzing uh, uh, capacities by pile deflections, uh, but very few uh, major design methodologies currently use this. The methodology does consider the load deflection characteristics of soil and rock along the sides, as well as the base of the foundation. It properly considers the length of the foundation and allows for the determination of the relative contribution of the capacity from both side shear and end bearing. And the factor of safety is based upon the total deflection criteria rather than the ultimate capacity or, or of the side shear and end bearing as, as taken individually. So let's uh, sort of go through how this procedure works. 
normally when you're analyzing a pile, you're looking at putting a load on from the top and seeing how it transfers downward. But this particular method, we start at the bottom and work our way up. So the first thing we need to do, though, is to define a load deflection criteria, both for end bearing and side shear. And that's often done uh, using uh, load test uh, data. Then we select an arbitrary end bearing uh, deflection. So at the very base of the pile, we put a load on it, and that load creates a deflection. That deflection then uh, can be input into the side shear component to see how much additional side shear will come off in that lower pile segment. We continue that procedure up the pile until by the time we reach the top of the pile, we have both an end bearing value and a cumulative side shear capacity. We re repeat the process using a larger deflection and again, uh, looking at the, the effects of that larger deflection on, on side shear uh, along the elements of the pile going from bottom to top. Ultimately, what we do is then we derive essentially a load deflection curve, very much like a, uh, a curve we would derive from a top-down load test. So I'm going to uh, now run through a, a case history uh, that shows how we can uh, put this uh, methodology into uh, an actual project. This case history is uh, uh, a medical office building uh, built at uh, Texas A&M uh, University. Yeah, this was actually in Bryant, Texas. Just a four-story building, uh, not terribly heavy. But the near surface soils did uh, have a, some expansion uh, potential and a deep foundation was selected for support. The original uh, geotechnical engineer on the project was using some traditional design methodologies and uh, selected an 18 inch diameter CFA pile, 80 feet in length uh, for the support of the building. And the allowable capacity that was selected was 100 tons. Uh, we were called in to take a look at this, to run some load tests and to see if we could uh, save some money, uh, some value engineering, uh, by uh, perhaps uh, modifying this pile type. This is the uh, typical subsurface profile. Uh, there was a high plasticity clay near the uh, ground surface, uh, and that was underlain by uh, a very stiff to hard uh, sandy clay uh, interbedded with, uh, uh, with clay sand. Uh, uh, some of the clay sand uh, and sandy clay materials actually look like a weak shale deposit. So the low test that was selected was an 18 inch diameter CFA pile. We selected a 50-foot embedment depth, and it was instrumented with strain gauges at uh, 3 feet, 10 feet, 25 feet, 35 feet, and 45 feet. The 45-foot one was intended to uh, uh, see what kind of end bearing we might have. The test pile was loaded to 500 tons of capacity. Uh, keep in mind, again, that the original design was an 80-foot pile and it was only supposed to take 100 tons capacity. Now looking at the uh, load deflection curve for that pile, uh, the blue line represents the uh, actual load test data. As you can see, uh, it, uh, it may have failed uh, using the Davison's method uh, somewhere around uh, 875 tons. Uh, did not fail using uh, the, the Brink-Hansen method. Uh, but again, the, uh, the pile did pass. But again, uh, the original design capacity was for 100 tons uh, for an 80-foot pile, uh, and this is a 50-foot test pile. So it did quite well. Now, if we look at the end-bearing capacity, 
Uh, as you can see, uh, it uh, ultimately took uh, 100. Uh, the, the amount of movement required here was uh, uh, about 0.4 inches to take uh, 100 tips per square foot. But if we look at the side shear capacity, uh, again, uh, most of the side shear capacity uh, was generated with about uh, one tenth uh, to two tenths of an inch of movement, uh, particularly some of the upper uh, strata. Uh, we basically maxed out on side shear below one tenth of an inch of movement. So again, there is some incompatibility here between uh, how much end bearing capacity we were taking versus how much side shear capacity we were taking. So there are different methods to determine the relationship between movement and side shear. Uh, API has uh, what they call TZ curves for different types of material. What I found uh, fits quite well is an arc tangent model. Uh, the side shear is equal to a, uh, what they call an alpha factor times the arc tangent of a beta factor times Z, Z being the uh, deflection. And the uh, alpha factor is related to some extent to the ultimate side shear capacity of the material. And the beta factor uh, is more related to the stiffness of the material. So a, a weaker uh, soil would have a low beta factor, and a stiff clay or a rock would have a very high beta factor. And what that does is it just changes the, the shape of the curve. A low beta factor uh, would have a more gradual curve to it, and a high beta factor would have a fairly uh, sharp curve. So you take the load test data and you create a model using uh, that formula. Uh, you basically curve fit using different alpha and beta factors, and you develop models for the various uh, strata uh, within the site. And uh, this uh, particular graph shows the, uh, uh, the models that were developed, the, uh, the dotted lines of the models, the solid lines are the original data values. So once we have all that uh, information, we can input that into the original load test to see if that model reasonably uh, mirrors uh, what we saw during the load test. And this is a uh, recreation of the load test uh, uh, using that model. And as you can see, it, it uh, follows uh, quite closely, uh, at least up to uh, the 800 uh, ton mark, and then, uh, then it starts to bear off somewhat. But certainly for a design value, uh, it certainly uh, models the, the load deflection curve quite well. So once we have that information, we can actually change the length of the pile, run it through the same analysis, and essentially develop load deflection curves for 60-foot piles, 70-foot piles, 80-foot piles, 50-foot piles, 40-foot piles, whatever length of pile we want. And by essentially recreating a load deflection curve, we can essentially run a load test without running a load test and then uh, assess uh, what the ultimate capacity of that uh, length of pile is, and then throw a safety factor on the ultimate capacity to come up with an allowable capacity. So as far as the application to this uh, project, uh, we essentially increased the allowable capacity of the piles from the 100 tons originally recommended to 200 tons. We reduced pile lengths from 80 feet to 45 feet. And in some cases uh, where we had to support the floor slabs, we actually put in some short piles just 25 feet long to support a small capacities of, of 50 tons each. So 
in conclusion, uh, the strain-based uh, pile design methodology provides a better overall model of load transfer and performance than traditional ultimate capacity analyses. And again, because the safety factor does change along the entire length of the pile. Uh, using a traditional method, using the same safety factor top to bottom, uh, mischaracterizes uh, how load transfer is actually occurring. So the method properly balances the contribution of side shear and end bearing and can be used to evaluate not just the capacity uh, of piles having different lengths, but also can tell you how much each pile uh, should move uh, under the applied load. At that point, uh, be happy to open this up to uh, questions. And, uh, There's one question, uh, James. All right, I'm looking. Okay. I don't see any uh, questions here. Maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> the question is, have you seen any densification effects on end bearing? In some cases, end bearing capacity seems to increase linearly, even at great settlements. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that was applied to mine, but uh, uh, I'm not sure there's any densification effects uh, for, for uh, just standard CFA piles. In fact, uh, uh, for, for traditional CFA piles, uh, oftentimes end bearing uh, doesn't occur until uh, uh, the pile moves fairly significantly, but uh, it, it all depends on uh, on the pressure of the grout being injected into the pile. But uh, you know, as far as this technique is concerned, uh, it is based uh, to a large extent on load tests, and uh, so uh, you basically have to define uh, what the load deflection criteria are for the various uh, strata, including end bearing. Up, I see another question has just uh, another question just came up. Do you see it? I'm okay, is long-term settlement considered uh, when shortening the length of the pile? Uh, certainly, uh, individual piles. Uh, we need to uh, uh, concern ourselves with settlement just as we would with any sort of a load test, uh, and certainly group settlements uh, still have to be taken into consideration. Uh, that's that's usually a larger concern because oftentimes there, we don't have single piles, we have groups of piles, so we, we still need to evaluate long-term settlement uh, as we would uh, any any type of pile. Uh, so yes, uh, shortening the pile, we still need to look at the, uh, the group effects and, and long-term settlement of the pile groups. Uh, I see another question. Uh, let me see, there's a... Uh, what technique is used to install instrumentation on the piles? Uh, again, we usually use uh, strain gauges, uh, generally uh, located on sister bars uh, on, the, on the cage itself, or if the cage is not uh, continuous top to bottom, we'll install those uh, strain gauges on, on a center bar that go top to bottom. And it says, would this method apply in the same way to H piles? Uh, it would apply uh, in the same way to H piles, except that H piles being uh, considerably stiffer, uh, probably uh, experience less uh, uh, strain or, or uh, differential compression than does a concrete pile, uh, just because the, the modulus of an H pile is 10 times greater. Uh, there would tend to be less uh, uh, differential uh, uh, compression of the pile top to bottom. But yes, the, it would uh, it would apply. Um, another question: What is the permissional uh, permissible settlement for CFA? Uh, that's very much uh, an issue related to uh, what the structural engineer will allow. Uh, we've used uh, I use CFA piles on the uh, Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, and on that particular project, the uh, Structural engineer actually allowed uh, up to five inches of total movement and three inches of differential movement. So that's very much a, uh, a 
an issue for the structural engineer uh, what what he can tolerate. Uh, see another question. One is coming in. If we do strain pay, uh, based pile analysis, uh, we do not need to check for geotech capacity using a safety factor of three for end capacity and two for friction, correct? Yes, so what we're looking at uh, with the strain based method is the overall safety factor on the pile system, not the individual safety factors for side shear and end bearing. Because again, uh, particularly with the side shear, we may have a safety factor of one near the top and three or four near the bottom, and the end bearing, uh, uh, for all practical purposes, we may not generate enough end bearing to even worry about it. But uh, uh, what we're looking for is the uh, combined safety factor of end bearing and side shear and, and apportioning those correctly. Very well, I don't see any other technical questions. There's one pending question uh, asked earlier uh, about the availability of these presentations. And uh, I'd like to remind you that they will be all available in the GI YouTube channel in a few weeks. So everything can be uh, re-seen or re-visited uh, in the GI YouTube channel when they're available, not only for this one, but for the entire week's presentations. So at this time, uh, I would like to thank James Niehoff for his uh, interesting presentation. He generated a good number of questions. And before uh, we move out, I would like to come back to, to our an extension of uh, our appreciation to all the people in the audience that have been uh, attending these four presentations, and also to our four speakers that uh, kindly gave of their time to prepare these presentations and make them available to the profession uh, in general, to the GI profession. Mr. Antonio Marinucci, Mohamed Mikawi, Rusted Mogadam, and James Niehoff. Uh, trying to get back here to our, to our original uh, slides. There we are. Uh, let's see now where we are. Yes. Uh, I'd like to go back to our, again, uh, as I just said, uh, presenting uh, our, exp our expression of appreciation to all the attendees and to the four presenters. And lastly, uh, but also very important, to uh, remind you of who were our sponsors, uh, Hayward Baker and Deep Excavations. Uh, our gold sponsor, Hayward Baker, who is North America's leader in geotechnical solutions with a network of local offices across North America each with direct access to the largest geotechnical knowledge base in the industry. Hayward Baker is ready to respond with the optimal solution wherever the location, whatever the size, whenever required. Solutions include foundation support, settlement control, ground improvement, slope stabilization, underpinning, excavation shoring, earth retention, seismic liquefaction mitigation, groundwater control, and environmental remediation. Hayward Baker is part of the Connected Companies of Keller, a multinational organization providing geotechnical construction solutions throughout the world. And also, we would like to, again, express our appreciation to Deep Foundations and the Deep Foundations software, uh, our silver sponsor. Deep Foundations is a premier software by Deep Excavation, LLC for the design of pile foundations. You can import CPT or SPT data to estimate changing soil properties. You can perform both axial and lateral pile analysis and calculate the combined axial and bending capacity. One software does all the top deep foundation capacity for you. Visit deepfoundation.com for a free web meeting with one of our engineering experts. In closing, to the audience, uh, we would like to, again, uh, express our appreciation. We understand we had an audience of around 74 people, and we look forward to continuing with this web conference format next year 
with new presentations and topic, topics in our deep foundations field. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you. This does conclude today's webcast. Thank you for your participation. Yes. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a great day.